And I think now it, it's kind of a bit bringing the practitioners from the industry to us and uh, uh, having, having um, a talk about what representatives of the industry think about of all of what we heard today and shed a bit of light on how this can play out in reality. So please welcome with me Claudia Amhügel. She's the Senior Director, Head of ESG Rating and Reporting at Deutsche Lufthansa AG. Good to have you with us today. Uh, I think, Claudia, yes, you are now taking care of ESG rating and reporting, which must be a huge uh, exercise these days in the aviation industry with all these numbers, which then effectively deviate from wherever you look at. Uh, and I think you have been uh, having different roles within Lufthansa and also having representing Lufthansa in Asia out of Singapore. So have seen a lot what this company can do and will be able to, to share your thoughts on this. Also, please welcome Bjorn Walter, who is the CFO of Condor Flugdienst GmbA. Good to have you with us today. Uh, yes, you have been holding uh, numerous uh, senior roles in the uh, travel and aviation industry. You have been a, sub a supervisory member of Condor before you then joined as a CFO, and I'm pretty sure you will be more than best placed to show your views on how financing of an, of an uh, uh, aircraft and airline uh, can be done today in line with ESG topics. Then please, again, Klaus Ohlmann, join us. Uh, who has been opening our discussions today with his views on uh, what flying can look like if it's, uh, if it's electric, if it's uh, innovative at a small scale, but also giving a lot of insights of what probably can even be done at a broader scale. And last but not least, Ingo, uh, back again as a moderator, HSBC, um, head of uh, DCM uh, in Europe, uh, you will uh, yeah, as, uh, serve as a moderator today and guide us through that, I'm pretty sure, very insightful discussion again. And so welcome to all of you and uh, keen to hear what you have to say on our topics today. Thank you. I think uh, Klaus still needs the microphone, otherwise we won't be hearing him. Uh, so uh, unfortunately he has uh, the, the first question, but I, I'm, I'm open to switch a bit. Uh, <laughs> so we have heard, uh, I would say, a bit of a, I would even call it a sobering um, uh, summary uh, from uh, Mr. Schirmacher about, yeah, what is, uh, what is there to do? Obviously, we have uh, heard uh, that SAF is playing a, a very important role uh, in, in this uh, transition to net zero. We'll come back later whether net zero is actually the right approach or something else should be there. But uh, Klaus or uh, Mr. Ullmann, um, obviously you as the uh, entrepreneur on our panel and the blue sky thinker and the, uh, the one that is looking more from an engineering perspective and from a practitioner's perspective. When you, when you listen to what the, what the, um, uh, what the, uh, uh, the bankers are saying, what, what, what maybe later on the practitioners, practitioners from the industry are saying, what would be your, let's call it positive, we can make it uh, um, uh, summary when you look at the recent developments uh, in the technology sector, more or less, we are here bankers and investors, when we hear 200 billion investment per year, uh, McKinsey is writing 175, we discussed about this, whether it's 100 billion or 175 or 200 billion, it's an awful lot of money. So do you see already recent developments and do you have hope that first of all this technology will be available and second that it will be available and affordable? Uh, I think uh, it's the same uh, what I said before it's all about efficiency so when I'm looking uh, recently I flew above uh, France and I flew above Germany and I saw that 70% uh, at that day of the windmills they were stopped. So then I say, okay, if you have 10 windmills, a park of 10 windmills, and only three of them, they are turning, that will say that they have a 30% efficiency. And uh, so what we need, from my opinion, uh, we need anyway a production in uh, areas where there is a lot of wind, and we need the transformation of this green energy for storage uh, purposes in hydrogen at first, and then probably with uh, the Fischer Trops uh, synthesis uh, in uh, e-fuels. Mm -hmm. I think we have no choice. Everything what I heard about uh, stuff, uh, that has to be done. 
There's uh, one problem there uh, that we have as well is transport. So if you produce hydrogen, it would be nice to transport it to Europe or where it, uh, where it use, is used. But uh, we have the problem that we have to make an infrastructure to transport it. Hydrogen is uh, not the same as LNG. So we need specific uh, transporter tankers to do that. You need uh, to make to take a lot of energy to liquefy it because minus 253 degrees is really an issue. And the losses on the transport as well because uh, hydrogen is the smallest element and it's very easy to uh, have diffusion a little bit everywhere. So losses is one problem as well. Uh, the efficiency, from my opinion, is better, much better as well from the cost side. If you produce, like in Haro Oni, uh, with Porsche, Siemens Energy, HIF, uh, which are producing uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel or intent uh, to produce that in the south of Chile. That's a place where I flew a lot. Nearly all my world record were done in these areas because I'm flying essentially with the wind. So in uh, the south of Chile or Argentina, you have uh, 11 months of wind. So if you will use to produce hydrogen and you will transform it there to e-fuels, then it's much more easier to transport as well from the costs to uh, Europe or everywhere else because Look, we have the possibility in a new to build tanker, 2,500 tons of hydrogen. If you transform it to e-fuels, you can use the existing fleet of uh, tankers with 250,000 tons per tanker. So. This is a cost related stuff. We are looking very often about efficiency only in the pro producing the, the hydrogen, but uh, it's the overall efficiency that counts. If I have wind uh, mills or solar panels, which are producing only 30% of the time uh, hydrogen, it's evident uh, that uh, if you store it in hydrogen or in e-fuels, it's a more, uh, it's less efficient if you make one step more or two steps more to transform hydrogen to methanol to ethanol and all the uh, produce uh, the, the SAF as well. But the overall efficiency is that was count, mm -hmm. from my opinion. Okay, and this is cost related as well. So cost related is of course a big uh, big challenge, obviously. Um, you, as you said, uh, uh, looking at the entire value chain and, and really looking across the different steps will require, um, you know, quite a huge investment. And Lufthansa being a, um, uh, a capital market participant and having issued bonds, being listed on the market, having uh, uh, issued loans um, uh, in the past is a well-accepted trademark in the, in the capital markets. The question is just, how do you feel when you hear these numbers, uh, 200 billion or whatever it is, is this something you, you deem to be feasible for, for Lufthansa to finance this? Uh, obviously, congratulations on your recent up, uh, upgrade. Obviously, the performance is so strong. We have heard that is, of, of course, driven by other factors, but uh, you know, obviously nobody knows what is, will be your share or probably you have your plannings, but do you feel that the capital market is supporting this way? Well, first of all, I have to say, as um, I was introduced very nicely, um, um, I'm doing ESG rating and reporting, so I'm not um, the lady doing the finance. But of course, uh, I'm involved because I'm uh, like the, the interface whenever it comes to ESG. And I must say, so far, I mean, um, I, the, the capital markets are supporting, uh, they're quite supportive um, still to the um, airline industry. And luckily, we are not the ones uh, producing or manufacturing the aircrafts, and we are not the ones producing or manufacturing stuff. So um, we are getting into it um, because, uh, as we heard it now with all the um, speeches, that SAF is really the game changer. And um, we as Lufthansa, and I assume also Condor, we are really supporting this, yeah, because um, SAF is really, um, we will need it. We will need it after 2050. We heard also 
that uh, about 70 to 75 percent of the CO2 emissions is um, coming from medium to long haul flights. And um, in this area, with the knowledge as of today, and as we heard it also, um, there will be no electric or hydrogen aircraft um, going longer distances with a lot more uh, passengers on board. And this is our business. I mean, so our business starts with more or less 100 passenger um, aircraft. Yeah. So, so far, um, I even must say we have been quite successful, although, you know, um, um, we had a big issue um, with the COVID crisis. So we are very grateful that the government um, was uh, supporting us with credits. But also, on the other hand, we were very fast out of it again. And um, you might have known that we have, um, well, I'm not the finance lady, but um, we, that we had the first revolving credit facility um, signed last year. So that was quite successful. And I think there were 27 banks involved. And um, if I may say so, um, we um, also integrated ESG part into it. So this was not uh, when it was launched, but we did it this year. And um, in one of the presentations, we saw also the um, Air France KLM sustainability linked, and they were putting this on the science-based target um, KPI, which is the CO2 per um, revenue ton kilometers. I don't know who said it, but I must correct it because we have been the first European airline group um, which has been validated by the science-based target, and we were the second, uh, the third worldwide, which was quite an achievement. And um, just coming back to this, and I think um, having a good ESG strategy, and also um, in the um, previous speeches was also about transparency, and this is what we are really working very much on it um, to. Um, communicate very transparently what we are doing. And I think even uh, being validated by the science-based target last year in August really helped us um, to integrate this also in our um, facilities. Yeah. Okay, so we come back certainly to, to uh, a concrete example what you're doing with, uh, but maybe uh, uh, Mr. Walter Bjorn, um, obviously you have introduced uh, uh, a couple of um, uh, new uh, air aircrafts on your on your recent um, um, fleet and obviously you are um, in the usual process of renewing your fleet saving uh, co2 emissions over there and of course with your business model uh, being less focused on um, business travel uh, more like on uh, charter and and, and tourism uh, um, do you actually see a, a, a wide support uh, from from the customer, uh, especially in your uh, uh, field, that they are actually going with you um, this journey to say, listen, in order to actually reduce our emissions, we have to invest. That will lead to potentially higher costs. Uh, and obviously, with your um, um, uh, new three th uh, 330 Neo. Um, you have this 20% uh, fuel reduction, uh, and uh, the, the question is, that are you able to pass on the costs to your customer, or is it that you say this is the operation, that's the license to operate, we will not be able to pass this on, and um, you know, what is the, go uh, the future on this? Um, <clears throat> I would say that um, you have to differentiate the um, period to 2050 a bit. Yeah, um, so I think you have a period of, and Lakish said that, we think in five, ten year terms as an airline industry, um, that over the next five to ten years, when the quotas are still um, realistically more or less doable, you get to a point when it's becoming more challenging, um, that I do see that with the rollover of the technology that we are doing, um, that the higher prices for SAF and the, the fuel in general will be compensated by the new technology. Afterwards, when the quotas get so high and we don't find means to uh, produce SAF in a more efficient way on, on the scale that we need, um, then there will definitely be an impact on prices. You have to, be, you have to see that. So for the period now and uh, from our own perspective, um, I'm confident that uh, we will not see too much of an impact on the pricing from where we are now yeah, because uh, for us we'll renew our complete white body fleet uh, within 18 months so in the middle of next year we'll have completely new technology on the long haul uh, and starting next year over the four years to come we'll have completely new uh, narrow bodies also so before 2028-29 our complete fleet will be new technology um, and therefore the savings on the technology will compensate for higher cost of fuel on a, on a ticket basis. Yeah. 
leave aside uh, a war in Ukraine, which pushed uh, the kerosene price to more than 1,500 at times um, last year. Um, on, on the period thereafter, um, and there I think the comment from, from Jörg was uh, extremely relevant, that um, I totally support the, whether it's carbon neutral or going to net zero, um, we have to set an ambitious target. Uh, and we completely support that in, in our industry um, associations and as Condor as well. Um, I think the approach we are taking in Europe um, to put too much of punishment on it and we are lacking a bit the support from the um, government bodies and politicians in terms of how do we get there. The investments required are huge, yeah, we, we need the funding, but we also need um, facilities uh, bureaucratic processes to make it happen, to, to have the facilities. We need a solution on the transport uh, because you can have some facilities at Frankfurt Airport to, to do SAF, but the supply of ingredients to produce SAF on location is just at some point limited. So they give you an outlook over the next five years what is possible, and then they say, okay, then we have to see if we can grow the production, depends on the availability of the um, of the materials needed to produce it. Uh, and then you are in the discussion on how do I transport um, either the stuff around to get them to the aircraft or can I produce them efficiently on location and to have the, the availability. So that's something we definitely need to sort out as an industry, but with the support and there I have, uh, as well as Jörg, uh, a favor for the approach the Americans are taking. Uh, so the, the carrot. Yeah. Maybe, uh, and, and we don't have, uh, obviously we have spoken about this, uh, very open for you to maybe uh, comment on this from, from, from the Lufthansa point yeah. of view. I can imagine you're pretty much of the similar opinion. Um, the question is then, okay, what concrete, what would be a concrete first or second step you would be asking for Berlin, Brussels, uh, or whoever is, is, is in charge. Yeah. So maybe two things. Maybe um, allow me to first uh, come to the customer, because I think this is a very important um, question. Yeah? Um, and it really needs to be said that until 2030, uh, probably the biggest and first lever really is fleet renewal. Yeah? I think this is for each and every airline. It's the same with us, because the, 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 um, the quantities of stuff will be so, so limited, yeah? And um, so I was yesterday in London um, because there was also a, um, um, yeah, a similar um, function uh, with ATAC and also the finance industry, yeah? And there was also a lady from the transport ministry in the UK. So I, I will come to this later because it's very interesting because they are very supportive. And um, I think what also you need somehow to integrate also the customer. So this is very much um, our Lufthansa Group strategy because, I mean, if you go to the supermarket and if you buy something sustainable, same thing. It is, it is more expensive, yeah? Uh, and um, so, and there are luckily a lot of customers, especially corporate customers, um, who do not say, oh no, I come now with a train, yeah? So, I mean, we are in the airline industry, yeah? And um, so if we are not flying, yeah? So, and if you do not promote flying, so, and you can fly also with a good conscious, so um, we have come up with this so-called green fare, whether the name is a good one or not, it's a different one, but we changed it a little bit into more sustainable flying, so where we integrated into our tariff that 20% that, um, of it is um, um, by SAF and 80% by um, offsets or compensation, yeah. So at least um, our customers see that tickets are getting a little bit more expensive and they have the choice, yeah, if they want really to, to do something better for the environment, they can do so, yeah. And this is, um, it's always a difficult question um, whether there is now a 10 or 20 or 30 percent of price increase with an airline. Uh, prices uh, also be done or made differently, yeah, it depends on the destinations, on the competition, so that's a big thing. But, of course, I mean, if we are going to use stuff and we all know also that the prices will not go down we always hear the the, um, the example with solar panels, yeah, that I think it took like 15 years or 20 years until price came down. This will be minimum the same, what experts are saying within SAF, even if it really goes down, yeah. So even if we have the quantities, even if we use it, the prices for sure then will go up. Um, the carrot and stick discussion, it was very interesting, yeah. And um, if you look even at all the, um, we heard also about the, um, 
the different legislations coming from the um, European Union. Yeah? And if you add up, especially um, within the EU taxonomy, yeah? if you want to fulfill this technical screening criteria um, to use SAF on, on the aircraft, then your um, uh, revenues on this aircraft are taxonomy aligned. Yeah? So no matter, we don't know when the EU taxonomy is going to start now, um, but even if it starts in 23, you have like 5% of SAF and then every year after this 2%. If you calculate this by 26 or 27, you have such a high amount of SAF, which is simply not feasible or not possible. So this is what I'm meaning also with, with the Refuel EU. So sometimes these legislations, they come up with ideas, they look good, but they are simply not feasible. Yeah? So in yesterday uh, in the UK, so... Um, I'm not completely into the UK legislation, but what, what, what I realized is that there's a much more support to bridge the gap between the price. And I think this is one thing um, where also apparently investors need the, the certainty yeah, that there is a certain price gap because um, we, like the airlines, what we do, um, we do offtake agreements. Yeah? So we have corporations with around 15 SAF producing or startup uh, facilities because it is not the typical BPs or shells, unfortunately, so they are not so much into it. They start with it. Um, and so what we do, I mean, we do guarantee the offtake, yeah? but I was also asked yesterday whether once we guarantee the offtake, whether there's a price tag behind. It's not because most of these facilities, they are in a, on a demonstration phase, so they do not produce right now. And this is apparently something what is happening much more in the UK so that they really work on this uh, price differential so that they give a certain um, um, assurance yeah, that they sort of bridge um, the gap. So, and I think this is really missing within the EU and I'm, it, 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 it needs to be seen and we are not even sure whether with refuel EU, the 6% in 2030 will be achieved. And if it's not achieved, um, the fuel companies, those who are providing the sustainable aviation fuel, I mean, they have to pay a penalty. But at the end of the day, of course, it's us, the airlines, who pay the penalty. So talking about stick or carrot, even with the 6%, it is not clear whether there will be 6% available. So um, as always, and we, hear, we, 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 we know these discussions from other uh, industries, I'm just talking about the utility industry, energy industry, car industry, steel industry is a very uh, common uh, topic here about the carrot and stock, uh, uh, stick. Uh, and of course, people will say, all right, how, how do they want to gap it? Where's the money coming from? Uh, I think this is a bit like, you know, where's the taxpayer coming into this whole situation? And of course, uh, we hear also that the Inflation Reduction Act has uh, very positive uh, effects. On the other side, it is also costing money. And um, so, uh, Klaus, coming back to what uh, Jörg said about, yeah, there are efficiency gains, there, there might be low-hanging fruits, and uh, taking a bit of a positive view, I understand from Jörg's comments, like, okay, it's nice, needs to be done, but it's not really moving the needle, yeah. Uh, how do you see this? Do you think that is, uh, is, is a one or two percent uh, question or is there more potential for low hanging fruits, meaning operational improvements, flight route improvements, etc., etc.? Do you see something that doesn't cost money that can be done? Or not doesn't, but doesn't cost so, as much. Yeah, so uh, when I see the airline, my wife is an airline pilot, so I know a little bit inside of the, uh, the airlines. So uh, what I can see, uh, what they do, they do it like I do. Uh, I use tailwinds, so we are flying in jet uh, streams from east, west to east, or we are flying uh, beside the set stream in order to have less wind uh, when we are flying against the wind. There's a lot of potential. Theoretically, you can use as well the vertical lifts. This is something I, I just uh, would like to make a bet between two uh, uh, two airplanes uh, flying along the Cordillera and uh, in, in the Andes and flying in the lift. So usually they are flying in the flatlands, I know, and there's a, a huge of amount of sinking. If you fly with the same plane, with the same fuel, I'm absolutely sure that you will be faster and you will have less. Uh, but it's very difficult. So nowadays we have numerical models which can 
quite well uh, model the, the lifts. So if you have really huge lifts on certain places, it's the same thing like you have a tailwind, you could use it to have uh, less fuel, uh, to use le less fuel and to fly faster as well. So I do not know if it, it's really, it's, it's a question of numerical models and uh, do they really work? Uh, but I would like just to, to go back uh, about uh, both what you said. You uh, spoke about punishment, punishment that the politics are doing. And uh, I, I said always, you need to address the customers. And uh, the customers, in the, uh, if you are buy, uh, buying bio uh, stuff, it's more expensive. And I think we need this transparency to show the customers what we are doing. I call it always, we take a, uh, would you like uh, the last uh, smartphone, the newest one, if you take a baseball bat and you say, if you don't buy it, I will hit you. No. So yeah. we have, uh, we have uh, today, we have other instruments of manipulation, if I would say. Uh, and if you have this transparency, what I told you before a little bit in the, my speech, and people are understanding what happens and people are understanding the problems of the industry. And it is important. I think they are willing to pay probably more. We, we heard a little bit the negative uh, impact. I don't believe really if you want uh, to fly and you have to fly, uh, you will spend a little bit more money. So, of course, uh, the, the, the politics are still asked to make this transparency. Transparency. I, what I hate uh, in the actual situation is always we need fear. The baseball bat. Why? You can you can uh, say to people what happens, and you can uh, make a, a lot of transparency, and then people will understand. I suppose. Mm -hmm. So more the positive carrot than the stick or the baseball bat. Both. Both. But um, maybe. Uh, when I was preparing uh, here this, this panel, I was surprised to read this net zero ambition of the International Airline Transportation Association. And to be honest, when I read this and when I read all the, the, the statements, I asked myself, not being an expert from the industry, how on earth can that uh, uh, work? Obviously, we have seen the challenges. We have heard about the challenges you have laid out what can be ahead, what will be happening until 2030, and then maybe afterwards. Nobody has a crystal ball, but uh, I think we also have learned we need to feed all different um, you know, ways uh, because nobody really knows what will be the final solution. Uh, and maybe there will be no final solution, but only like a, a big array. When you, from, a, from the uh, industry as a representative, Bjorn, if you hear this, net zero and we hear from your green fair um, product it looks of course this is a product which is effective and it's here in 2023 so you seem to go the way of net uh, or zero neutral uh, uh, so you are talking about offsetting you want to uh, you are obviously saying as Lufthansa we can reduce to a certain uh, amount at the moment and the rest we need to compensate to some extent because we feel this is not possible. When you hear this net zero uh, 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 claim, what do you think? Do you think this is really realistic or do you think it will be more this uh, uh, neutrality? Now, can I park for a second uh, just uh, to your comment on what the, the low hanging fruits? I, th I think we're talking too little about those because we currently have so much inefficiencies in the systems on the airports, on the slot usage um, on delays, yeah, which just cause really unnecessary fuel burn uh, on, on the ground or in the air, where we can become much better. And that's even though uh, we are this year somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of pre-corona capacity, so we are not even at the levels yet um, that we had uh, 2019. So uh, I'm really a bit afraid that we at the moment increase the inefficiencies uh, just to to have unnecessary burn, and that's something um, we are discussing with the airports and with the authorities uh, as well, and also reviewing internally 
but I think that we have to stress because it's yeah. just... Uh, if I may. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really have to stress this one because I also heard, um, sorry, Jörg, um, um, a drop in the ocean more or less. And I think because I had a um, presentation today also with, uh, with my team on this one, and I said, this is the only thing, to be honest, besides fleet renewal, the airlines partly, partly can do on their own because there is really the, uh, the ops efficiency. And we're talking here about at least five to seven, whatever percentage point. I think European Spy used to talk about 10%. We all know this is probably not going to happen, but half of it, the airlines can do themselves. As you just ex explained it, and, and we do this also, of course. I mean, we look that um, we have better systems, better weather forecast, um, that the pilots take uh, less kerosene, um, less water. Um, we reduce uh, the light uh, materials. Yeah, so, and um, I always stress this. Of course, this is not so fancy, yeah, like new aircrafts or the production of sustainable aviation fuels, yeah, um, the the taxi with one engine. So there's so many things, yeah. And if we end, and if we even save only one or two percent uh, per annum, it is already a lot, yeah. So sorry, I didn't want to jump no, in no, because no, I um, this really always really gets forgotten, and it has to do also something with uh, mindset, yeah. Um, not that our pilots don't have the mindset, I don't want to say this, yeah, but sometimes it gets forgotten, yeah, and, and they are also then proud, yeah, if, if, uh, because if everybody can really contribute, yeah, and it is also the pilots, yeah, they say, okay, now we can take a detour because um, in our team there's also a pilot and I know what's, what, what, what they can do, yeah, they can ask the shorter way, they, but they need to be, of course, active and take the decision. So, sorry, but I also yeah. just wanted to support you that it's very important. And there we are also taking a more positive approach because the pilots, they do get after their flight, they do get their fuel burn and fuel efficiency feedback, but they are not punished if they are bad, but they, are, they feel good if it's yeah. uh, below if average they and if, if they can contribute. Yeah. And then to, to the question about the net zero, I, I think to have the ambition is completely right. Yeah, because if we don't have the ambition, we will go not too far anyways. Yeah, so I'm completely aligned with um, um, the ambition and that we have to try everything to get there. Yeah. Um, if we look at where we stand today, uh, probably to reach a net zero in 2050 seems a bit uh, unrealistic. Yeah, we, we talked about the fleet and the time of the fleet renewal that is up in the air. I mean, just to exchange once is 10 years, but at the moment we only have the current technology, so it's still using SAF, and then we are somewhere mid-30s. Um, and then it's only 15 years to go to 2015, and then it comes down in the end to how much SAF is available to, to come to net zero. Will we be able to fuel 100% of the, of the, let's say, then old fleet uh, with uh, SAF? Um, and that's why I stressed in the beginning, we need much bigger plans to get to that production over time. Um, and that's where I have my question marks. Yeah. Even if we have a dozen or 20 startups, um, this needs to be quicker to a bigger scale. Um, and also with the support on the infrastructure and there, I honestly have to say, especially in, in the country we are living in, all infrastructure projects take a long time. Uh, if you, or they, it's just, that we have to become faster in implementing these changes. And we have set the targets, and now we, ha we from our side, we also have to come with proposals because I don't think we have a sufficient view yet on how to reach that, so it's also on our side. On the other side, we also need the support, otherwise we will not make it happen to get the infrastructure in place to be able to um, get somewhere near that net zero target in 2050. Yeah, and if I may uh, do also a pitch no, to the finance community, because there is ample opportunity yeah, to invest, and it's um, not that much about the aircrafts. Of course, yes, we need it, and I think that's very well established. Yeah, but um, we are talking in 2050 probably between 4,000 and 5,000 of these um, sustainable aviation fuel plants. Yeah, and um, so. And even if we if we are looking into 20, 2030, yeah, we are talking about 160 to 250 newly built ones, yeah. And um, so this is this is really a huge potential, and we need because uh, people might get it also a bit um, uh, irritated because there are so many feedstocks, so many different pathways, technologies, um, and most probably we need most of them. And um, 
I think a very good thing, and this is where Germany is quite uh, into it, and, I, and we are also very grateful, it's the power to liquid, for example, or we, we are very much looking into the sun to liquid, yeah, because then it's really the direct sunlight, yeah, which, which uh, serves um, uh, as energy source. So I think this is something to say something good about, like the, the German support, put it this way, or the government. Yeah, so they are looking very much really into this power to liquid and, and hopefully also more sun to liquid um, technology. And um, so and I also wanted to make the point because, uh, because you were talking about then the, uh, if we order now the aircraft, it's then old in 2030 or 2035. Um, I don't know how familiar the, the audience is with the sustainable aviation fuel because this is a drop-in fuel, yeah? So, and um, I always try to, to stress the point that the um, aircraft, it's not stranded uh, um, uh, investments because at the end of the day, they all can fly on this stuff, yeah? And so Airbus and Boeing, they're working heavily on getting the, the quota, the, men, the quota which is now by 50% up to 100%, yeah? So even now the investment in all the aircraft, yeah, it'll, long, it'll really be long lasting, yeah? And as said, in 2050, we still need the aircraft with uh, going over the Atlantic uh, with sustainable aviation fuel, yeah? And um, the more the better. And uh, maybe also to point a little bit out that especially power to liquid and also sun to liquid is, is really the sort of third generation, which then is not that much, especially sun to liquid in the competition with the renewable energy, I think, because this is also an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe to add as a, as a positive outlook, I think, um, especially if we're talking about four or 5,000 plants that we need, we need them decentrally. Uh, yeah. uh, for me, it's a big opportunity also to change our energy policy uh, because we now see what the dependence on one or two pipelines uh, from the east have caused also for us in just getting the supply of uh, fuel to the airports uh, in, in the current situation. Um, and I think this new technology with a more decentralized approach can let's say, yeah. also make us as a country or as Europe more independent uh, if, if we do that right. Yeah. And um, therefore it's, it's a general opportunity beyond the aviation industry uh, on how we can yeah. change our place in the, in the, in the energy supply. Yeah. If I may. Um, and yesterday I also learned that um, the oil production is only within 22 countries worldwide. Yeah, And if we would go into the sustainable aviation production, I mean, this is more or less endless. So you can bring this to most of the countries. You need a lot of different feedstock. You probably have different countries, different policies. So the US is very, mu very much on uh, municipal waste, for example, which wouldn't work, for example, in Germany. And it's good that we have these different feedstocks and, and, and also um, pathways. But also, um, we talked the entire day about only E and only about CO2, yeah? And maybe this is also um, a good thing for just transition, because I also learned yesterday that um, with setting up all these plants, you probably might create another 40 million jobs yeah, all over around the world. And as you just said, to diversify this a little bit, uh, it's also, I think, a super chance, but still a big challenge to us. I think these are very hopeful concluding remarks, um, and uh, they give uh, a bit of a uh, way to actually reflect uh, on, on, on what we need to uh, do here. Uh, something uh, very similar uh, topics for very many industries all over the, uh, the place, uh, transformational in industries. But uh, thank you very much for a very open discussion. Uh, and it was very easy for me to moderate because you were <laughs> jumping in very easily and uh, that is how it should be. And uh, thank you very much for your insight view on um, how, how you feel the aviation industry can transform basically.